I'm Dr. Nicola, and I am joined by Paul Gordon. He is an MD with bipolar, and he wrote the book, My Life as a Physician with Bipolar Disease. He has a very interesting message. I'm very excited to have him on the show. Welcome, Dr. Paul. Welcome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So uh, tell us about your story. You have an interesting one. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, although there are other bipolar doctors, I don't think many have written on come out of the closets in the way I have. But my journey with this uh, alb albatross, I call it, started in 1973. When I was a medical student, actually, in my third year at Washington University School of Medicine. And we had no uh, lectures the first two years about psychiatry, surprisingly. So when I started to get the symptoms of early morning awakening, whining, not wanting to get out of bed, uh, fear, hopelessness, that my career would never, that it would be cut short. Uh, I didn't really know what was going on with me. I just know that I was feeling what I call a despair of despair. And uh, two or three weeks into it, I said, this has got to be a brain problem. So I called uh, a university psych hospital and got an appointment really pretty quickly, I think because of the way I said it to the receptionist. With, like this was a now thing. And uh, a fellow who I'd like to mention because he's uh, passed and because I think he saved my career and my life, Dr. McClure, James McClure, uh, saw me that afternoon. We tried medicines for a few weeks. The medicines back there, back then, you know, tricyclics, et cetera, uh, it just don't work well. It didn't work for me. I ended up in the hospital, I kind of had gone into a almost psychotic state and depression. and. Uh, he uh, tried medicines again, and after about two weeks, I actually said to him, I think I want electroconvulsive therapy. I mean, I do want it. And a big smile came across his face because I knew that's what he was waiting for me to ask for. And remarkably, after the third or fourth treatment, I was back to Paul. I was normal. And... Uh, I did the last four treatments or so as an outpatient, and uh, that's what I mean by saved my life, because I then went on back to my rotation at the medical school. So the journey continues in that three years later in 76, I had another episode uh, in my also third year, but now it was as a medical resident at UCSF. And this time I knew what was happening, so it wasn't so frightening, uh, still despair. But I called him in St. Louis and I said to him in these exact words, I want to fly back to St. Louis and get Zach. And he said, come on over. I will do it all as an outpatient. <laughs> and I walked out of a cardiology clinic, just said, I'm leaving to the chief resident and flew back there. And yeah, again, after three treatments as an outpatient, all better, finish the eight treatments. That takes about three weeks because they're every other day. Back to San Francisco, finish my residency fellowship in San, in St. Uh, back in St. Louis. Uh, so that's just two discrete episodes, which I mean that uh, anywhere from two months to six months, depending upon how quick medications take place. What were the treat? What did, what was involved in the treatments? Just in the first two, it was these old medicines that uh, had lots of side effects and were very ineffective. Uh, you may have heard of Elavil. That's one of them. Uh, he tried everything in the hospital, even for psychosis, stelazine, all the way up to. The, anyway, so why? I think you asked why did I choose uh, electroconvulsive therapy? The, the first two times it was because I had lost all response to anything. And I didn't think of it as in the, the, the negative, the, the, these days they, it's, people are pretty uh, down on ECT. And I say that's possibly because of Ken Kesey, but anyway, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And lately, a lot of others on, on the internet. But just as today and as in uh, 2015, same procedure. I'm not going to go through it, except that it's 
it's easy, it's quick. The only side effects are nausea and a little bit of uh, retrograde amnesia. I mean, we forget some stuff from just before. I had none of that. So, but in this, years ro rolled on. I think my next one was in 82. I was already in practice in Modesto. The new medicines had come out, the SSRI, so Zoloft, et cetera. And then in 88, when I had a first manic episode, uh, an obvious manic episode, then the lithium went on. Well, actually, my doctor said after hearing the story, he said, well, now you're a lithium man. And I remained on that and uh, plus an antidepressant and a benzodiazepine, and that carried me through the next five or so ma major depressions. For me, being bipolar two, my depressions were more frightening and more uh Actually, I still fear them because there's no trigger. It just happened almost like a switch is being turned on. And one, next day, I'm what might start out is as early morning awakening. And then it just gets worse from there. My last episode was in 2015. Uh, only two episodes had triggers. One was when my wife died in 1992. Now, I also, there's a book by Dr. Jemmy that discusses the fact that if you've been through a major depression or two, you're more able to take on a challenge. Like uh, Winston Churchill or JFK, Cuban Missile Crisis, Winston Churchill, uh, the war. And I had to do that. I had to uh, take care of my 12-year-old and 8-year-old, get them settled with uh, a nanny, which, which happened quickly, and uh, I'm absolutely indebted to Rebecca. And uh, the other was to set up my office, which uh, before she had died, we had decided to leave, leave the big group uh, here in Modesto. Um, many reasons. And I went out and went to my own practice. And so I had to get that all set up. And so within three months of Priscilla's dying, I was on track with the office. But in January of 93, then I could start to grieve and I crashed and burned into my 1993 depression. Wow. So how did it lead to the book? Right, the book. Yeah, well, I dabbled in writing all my, from the 90s, uh, it was a spy novel, <laughs> just to, as therapy and to keep me busy. And of course, I didn't get published, but it, it, I'd worked on it for years and it was fun, just the creative process. So when I approached uh, retirement in 2012, I retired in 2013, I said, well, I'm going to write about something I know about. So I wrote uh, this memoir at first and decided, and it was very easy, and decided to make mental advocacy my second career which hopefully would last as long as another 39 years as my first career as a doc. This book, actually, uh, the, the publisher uh, wanted me to write a book first because she calls it well, the why behind, behind writing a book. She doesn't think of memoirs for a, a, leg a legacy. She believes that you need to have a why for writing it. So I wrote a first book called uh, An Insider's View of Bipolar Disease, which is a fact-based reference book that came out first, uh, 15, I think, and the uh, memoir 16, and then these two, it's just been, and the, the advocacy, I mean, the passion I have for the, and the gratification I get from reaching out to all sorts of people and uh, giving talks and, and doing this, it's like, I know I'm helping a lot of people, who, those who reach out to me, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a good choice. So who could this help? And maybe could you share one or two lessons that would uh, help someone in this well, scenario? I wanted to first direct my attention to what I call first responders. Uh, these would be EMTs, nurses, uh, nursing students, uh, even medical students, because they, they see these problems first. Uh, so I do that in a few high schools to make the the teenagers occurring at earlier and early ages uh, be aware of uh, mostly major depression. 
it's not good enough when a student says to another student, oh, I'm feeling depressed, I don't want to kill myself. And the student that's listening doesn't contact that person's parents. Uh, how do I, uh, what was that last question again? So who could it help? And then how, what are some lessons that maybe? Well, I call it the rule of four. Uh, first of all, the individual, and it's usually in the third decade that these diseases start. Um, very big crossroads in everybody's world. Uh, I, I say that to, the, to them, because some of them reach out to me or their parents do, I say, well, the first thing is to recognize and accept that you have bipolar one or bipolar two or major depression. And that is a major roadblock. Uh, second is to have a good support person. Now, I had no good support person because my, my parents didn't really believe in this concept being older, older generation. And I was living alone in St. Louis, so it was doubly difficult. So having a good support person who uh, you can talk to and, and that person can say, hey, you got to get help. And the, the third limb is you got to find not just a primary care doc, but this, psychiatrists are are the ones that need to treat you. And finding a good psychiatrist and one that you can click with. And the fourth thing is you have to be patient. These medicines can take six to eight weeks to kick in. So a person starts the medicines, it's going to be some juggling around. And meanwhile, you're suffering. But once you get on a good regimen, the fourth limb is staying on the medications. And did you find any uh, effects with changing your diet? Did you ever play around with that? In my case, no. It is part of the other limb we call mindfulness uh, exercises. And I'm sure there's one about diet. I'm not having researched that, but breathing exercises, uh, which I do, uh, yoga, Pilates, I don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> and exercising, all part of the, uh, maybe that's the fifth uh, limb of my five. Yeah, good. Excellent. So how can people find this book? Uh, it is on Amazon. Okay. Uh, under its title uh, or under my name. Uh, the other, well, one other is on Amazon as well, and the two newest are uh, self-published on Amazon with the help of my wonderful marketer. Wonderful. Good. Well, Dr. Paul Golden, I'm so grateful that you're on the show. I hope your book can help a lot of people, I'm sure, out there. Are there any final words that you want to share with my audience? Well, you know, I have a passion for this, uh, and so... However the book does, uh, it was a passion to create it. And the people who reach out to me through them, and I'd like to give you my website and email, who reach, reach out to me uh, through these mechanisms and uh, Facebook, uh, ask me questions. Uh, lots of times it's uh, how to find a psychiatrist, et cetera. Lots of times it's mothers of, of schizophrenic children, older children. That's a real problem. Half of them don't even know they're sick. Uh, so that that that's what I, our psychiatrist always says is, well, you know you're helping a lot of people. So, I love that. Yeah. So important to try more than one therapist if the first one isn't working. I've heard that multiple times now that sometimes you don't click with the first one and, and it's it's really important that you don't give up. Absolutely, and you, you need to have other people recommend that may be other people who've already been seeing psychiatrists. Now, sadly, in a town our size, which is 250,000 now, there are a very dearth of psychiatrists and even more dearth of ones that I consider I could click with or that no medicines will. Wow. So that's got to change. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thank you for being on the show and sharing all your wisdom. I'm sure you will be able to help so many people. Yeah, what is your website? It's www.mdgolden.com. Mdgolden.com. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. 
Excellent. We'll put that up in the description as well so let people will have the link. All right, Dr. Paul Golden, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to speak with you. You too. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.